Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our lecture series on cavity optomechanics. Before we start, just some formalities. Feel free to keep your video on so we have a more lively interaction or switch it off if you're more comfortable like that. If you have any questions throughout, feel free to unmute yourself and just ask the question, or you can also put them in the Zoom chat. If you're on YouTube, just put them in the chat and we'll forward them to the Zoom chat or we'll, we'll ask Vittorio so you can answer your questions. So um, with that, it's a welcome for us to uh, welcome, um, it's a pleasure for us to welcome Vittorio Piano as a lecturer. Uh, he's a senior scientist at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. Um, he started his uh, academic career with a PhD at the University of Düsseldorf under the supervision of Professor Reinhold Egger. And then he had various postdoc positions and one in Freiburg at the Institute of Technology, um, one at Michigan State University before coming to Erlangen University. Um, and then he joined the University of Malta as a lecturer. Since 2018, he's at the Max Planck, Max Planck Institute for the Science of Flight. Um, and his research lies at the interface between quantum optics, nanophysics, and has a special focus on quantum noise, topological physics, and deep learning. So a lot of really exciting topics, and also his uh, schedule for the lecture sounds really exciting. So we're very much looking forward to your lectures. Floor is yours, Vittorio. Thank you very much, Clara, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, okay, so um, as the title says, I will try to give some overview of this broad field of cavity optomechanics, and I will start from the basic concepts. So the idea is that uh, um, I will just give for granted uh, basic uh, undergraduate quantum mechanics. Um, okay, and uh, before I start, maybe I make a little bit of advertisement of our institute. Uh, so I work at the Max Planck Institute uh, for the Science of Light in the theory division, which is led from uh, by Florian Marquardt. Uh, and we are located in Erlangen, this is in the north of Bavaria. You can see it on the map and uh, this is our institute. And a special thanks goes also to Florian because I didn't have uh, uh, much time to prepare the lecture and I accepted to give them just because uh, he very nicely offered to share his material so he gave many lectures in optomechanics and uh, so this was really very helpful. Okay so I start uh, I start with some uh, like generic motivation uh, so I hope that at the end of the lectures I will convince you that optomechanics is interesting for many reasons and uh, that there is both a fundamental and an application side of it. And for the for this introductory motivation, I, I pick up two um, to examples. And uh, I guess I start with the fundamental side. So I guess uh, all of uh, you have heard of the Schrodinger cut. Uh, so this is a thought experiment that uh, illustrate the uh, like counterintuitive and uh, maybe even unpleasant <laughs> consequences of uh, the superposition principle when uh, applied to, to the macroscopic world. And uh, um, maybe most of you, uh, though, haven't heard of some precursor uh, thought experiment uh, uh, that uh, it's uh, known as the Schrodinger's mirror. So this was four years before the Schrodinger cat in 1931. Uh, and uh, has been illustrated in a letter uh, by Schrodinger to Sommerfeld that I'm going to read to you. Dear Sommerfeld, in our seminar, we have debated for hours about the following case, which should be simple in principle, at least thinking in one dimension. We measure to high precision the momentum of a heavy mirror and simultaneously the position of a light quanta. Hence, the color of the light quantum and the position of the mirror are very uncertain. Uncertain. Afterwards, I let the light quantum be reflected from the mirror. The mirror take up, takes up twice the momentum of the light quantum. And after this has happened, and after the light quantum has moved away, I have the choice to find out either the position or the color of the light quantum by performing a measurement on the mirror. So as you see, it's, the story is very similar as the, the Einstein 
Podolsky Rosen experiment, but it's for uh, year earlier. So the idea is that if I know the position of the of, of, of the of the light quantum and I'm in one dimension, I will know it also in the future. And I can wait that the light quantum is cut, uh, is reflected by the mirror. Uh, and when it's very far away, I can make uh, a, a measurement on the mirror. And uh, um, it's very counterintuitive. And, and then if I know then the momentum of the mirror, that I can measure with arbitrary precision, I can also deduce what was the energy of the photon and what is the, the energy of the photon. And so this uh, like uh, shows that I need this Pukki action at distance that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, that Einstein was talking about in, in the Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen experiment. And it's also a precursor of the Schrodinger cat because there is this micro micro entanglement. So there is the a microscopic uh, particle, the photon entangled with the macroscopic object, though I'm not, not, not living one yet. Um, okay. Um, and so, but it's also like really pure optomechanics. So it's the quantum entanglement of mechanical motion in the light field. So this is, uh, this show that this really, we are now exploring in this field, uh, like thought experiment that uh, had inspired the premier of, of quantum mechanics. And now more on the application side, uh, another example why uh, optomechanics is so exciting. Um, so for um, quantum computing, computing one of the most promising platform are superconducting uh, qubit. And uh, these interact with cavities in, in the microwave. And uh, they are so good because in the microwave, we have a very strong nonlinearity. So the Josephson, um, given by Josephson Junction, the Josephson nonlinearity. Uh, on the other end, uh, uh, Optical light is really good because it can travel, uh, inter it interacts very weakly uh, with the environment and it can really travel for, for uh, long distances. So you can, could think of, a, of um, a future where we have quantum computer, uh, then are uh, talking to each other by a quantum internet. And for this, uh, like the missing link is we, we need a way to, to make these microwave photons uh, communicate to, to the optical photon. So we need uh, a way to convert uh, uh, to basically to, to transfer the information that is maybe encoded in the microwave photons to an optical photon. Um, and this is difficult and requires an linearity because I have really to change the, the frequency by many order of magnitude from the microwave to the optical regime. And I do it in a coherent and reversible uh, fashion such that I can do this kind of thing. So I, I, I start off with microwave photons, then I have a black box, then convert it to, uh, to, to the optical regime, and then I let it travel for a long distance, and I convert it back, and then I do some other calculation somewhere else. And uh, yeah, so a spoiler, <laughs> optomechanics can do this. So it's important. It's uh, it's uh, I, we will see the optomechanics kit, the nonlinear interaction that allows you to do this. Um, okay, so uh, now a, a, a little bit of overview. Um, I will start by illustrating uh, by talking about in general about radiation forces in, in a very simple setting, uh, uh, also without a cavity. Uh, and then I will uh, talk about the optomechanical Hamiltonians. I will briefly uh, describe the most uh, relevant optomechanical platforms uh, and uh, describe some very basic physical effects. Uh, and then the, this is all the, le the lecture today. And then there will be a lecture that will be dedicated to precision sensing. Uh, including the, the gravita gravitational wave detection, uh, gravitational interferometers. Uh, and okay, I will also mention this later on, so I don't need to say more now. And then I will um, talk about the, like the quantum to box of, of optomechanics. So uh, how can, I can achieve squeezing, cooling to the ground state and entanglement of mechanical and optical components. 
and then this toolbox, and then I will describe how this toolbox uh, then allows me to, in a, in a more multi-mode setting where I don't have only an optical and a mechanical mode, to uh, um, engineer interesting application with more uh, modes, like for instance, routers and what I mentioned before, frequency conversion. And then uh, I would like to dedicate uh, a lecture more to nonlinear and topological optomechanics. So it's all a work in progress. So until now, I prepared only the first lecture, so it might change. <laughs> but yeah, let's see. Okay, so first of all, um, yeah, some historical motivation. So the the concept of radiation pressure has been uh, proposed very early on by John uh, Kepler in, in 1700. So he had observed that the tail of a comet points always away from the sun. Uh, and then uh, he thought that, um, yeah, this is a proof that the dust that originate uh, from, from the impact of, of the comet with the atmosphere is, uh, like um, experience a force by, by the radiation. And uh, uh, actually a theoretical underpinning of this idea uh, came with uh, uh, basically in late uh, 1900 when uh, uh, James, uh, Maxwell, James K. Maxwell proposed his, uh, his Maxwell equation and uh, the Maxwell equation predicted that there, there um, there are electromagnetic waves, and these electromagnetic waves uh, uh, carry a, a, an energy flux that is quantified by the by the pointing vector. And if I divide the pointing vector by the speed of light, uh, I uh, find the radiation pressure by by the electromagnetic field. And if um, all the energy is absorbed by a perfect absorb is given is given just by the pointing vector divided by the speed of light. Whereas if I have a perfect mirror uh, where um, no energy is absorbed and uh, all, uh, and basically all the momentum is uh, basically twice the momentum is transferred, I have twice the, the, the radiation pressure. Okay, and then of course, shortly, shortly thereafter, there was a, 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 a big, um, yeah, a strong interest in measuring this uh, radiation pressure uh, predicted by Maxwell. And uh, now I, I want to tell a story that of, uh, before I start, tell you how they, they achieved this. I wanted to start uh, with how they attempted, and, but they didn't. Uh, okay, wait, I, I just wanted to, to, to first, I, I was forgetting this part, yeah. First of all, uh, Let's get an idea how strong is, is the radiation pressure. So, um, if I keep in mind, so I, uh, that the radiation flux from the sun to the earth is more or less one kilowatt uh, per square meter. Uh, the point is that for the radiation pressure, I have to divide by the, the speed of light, and so I will get a very small force. For instance, I can I can ask myself, so what what would be the force on a on a one centimeter square. And if I make the calculation, uh, well, I would just have to multiply, divide this by the speed of light, which is quite high, and uh, multiply by the, the, the area in, in meter. And I arrive to, to a value of uh, like nanonewton. So it's quite a very small force. And so, uh, and, um, and so, then the, the, the scientists at the time had the challenge uh, of measuring this very small force. And the first attempt uh, made its way, in, the first unsuccessful attempt <laughs> made its way in the, um, let's say in popular science, science, <laughs> science <laughs> until now as a, as a very popular uh, like uh, toy, uh, which is known as the light meal, uh, but at the time was known as Crookes uh, radiometer, uh, and that the hope was um, so you see it, it it's uh, it's like a meal that has some veins that have two surfaces, so one is as a mirror and the other uh, one is very strongly reflecting, is almost a perfect reflector, and the other like you see is dark, it's perfect absorber, and so the hope would be that if you shine light on it, 
since uh, the reflecting part uh, uh, reflect twice, uh, absorb twice as much the momentum. So the momentum transfer is twice as much that it would start uh, to rotate. Um, and indeed, uh, when they performed the, the experiment, uh, this works, so it started to rotate and Crookes claimed that this was uh, a measure uh, of the radiation pressure. And I think that the, the thing that I find slightly amusing <laughs> is that also Maxwell was a strong advocate that that basically it uh, that this was really the proof that uh, his prediction was uh, um, so that his prediction had, had been has been confirmed. Uh, but uh, the funny thing, if if you have ever had the ch chance to um, to um, to own this toy, so if you shine light on it, uh, oh, what am I doing? So you see, it's rotating the wrong direction. Um, the the black side rotates. So it's really funny that Max really wanted to see his elegant theory confirmed and really believe this, <laughs> although there is this um, very macroscopic problem with the experiment. And indeed, so uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Lebedev uh, shown that. Um, so first of all, it's important that this thing works only if it's at least partially under vacuum. Um, but Levitt showed that if you really decrease the vacuum uh, very much, it just stop working. It doesn't rotate at all. Um, and indeed, uh, so this is not how people uh, measure uh, radiation pressure. This has been achieved by Nichols and Ohms that uh, had uh, in spirit a similar device. So it also had like these uh, plates that were that has an absorbing and affecting side, but now they were um, mounted on a so-called uh, Nikos radiometer, which is basically a torsion pendulum. And so it's uh, it's like a torsion pendulum, and they were shining light on it, and they were able to to measure the 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 displacement. The, the, the angular uh, displacement caused by, by the radiation pressure. And so this was very early in, in 1900, and they were able to, um, to, to measure the radiation pressure with a precision of 1%. So this was really quite an impressive experiment. OK, so if now we go uh, fast forward <laughs> to more uh, modern times. So a very uh, impressive application of, um, of radiation pressure is the Icarus mission from the uh, Japanese um, <laughs> space program. Uh, basically, they, um, they create, a, so as the name says, interplanetary kite craft accelerated by radiation uh, of, of the sun. So basically, it's a solar sail. Um, and uh, so the, the, the so it's I think it's like fourteen times fourteen meters, so one hundred and ninety six uh, square meter, and um, it works with liquid crystal, so it, it can um, the reflectivity can be tuned, and basically that's how it's tiered. So uh, and it's really propelled just by 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 the by the radiation force. Here the idea is that the uh, the force is really tiny, um, so millinewton. And think about it. So it, with this tiny force, uh, it traveled uh, 40 million kilometers. So the distance from, from the Earth uh, to Venus, which is 40 million kilometers. Um, and the, the, yeah, the, this is possible because in space, there, basically, there is very little friction. And so a very tiny acceleration uh, allows you to reach very high, high speeds. And so this is really amazing. Um, OK, and then uh, there is another story where radiation pressure uh, plays a, a, a very big role. Um, we will talk about this later. And these are the gravitational interferometers. Um, so here, the idea is that uh, okay, radiation pressure is what comes in the way of having uh, eventually, if you do everything uh, well, it comes in the way of uh, 
having uh, uh, even better, uh, even more precise uh, uh, measurements. So the idea is that we want to make a measure gravitational wave, and so there will be uh, the idea is that uh, because of gravitational wave, the length changes, and what uh, so everywhere there will be like some strain, and which means that uh, the length. Uh, so I so I will the, the this a change of distance is proportional to the distance, and so that's why I have this this interferometer with these uh, huge arms. And uh, basically, I'm shining light in this interferometer. And then at the end, I will measure a, a phase shift. Um, and then, um, I, I, at the end, I, I will measure a, a phase shift. And um, if I do everything well, uh, what will come in the way is quantum noise. Uh, and uh, but I can uh, reduce the effect of quantum noise by having uh, really a lot of uh, light in the interferometer. And if I, um, but then there is a limit because if the light is too strong, then the mirror will start to jitter because of the radiation pressure, setting a limit to the precision that I can achieve. Okay, we, I will explain this more in, in more details. Um, maybe I think that was already too much <laughs> and not so clear. Sorry about that. Okay, but this allows us to monitor events that uh, happens, very dramatic events that uh, happens uh, in the remotest area of the universe, like the annihilation of, of uh, black holes. And as you see here, uh, uh, so it's it's amazing. So the the strain in, in for this event was of the order of 10 to the minus 21, and which means since I had uh, like uh, a, an arm of the interferometer of the order of, of the order of kilometer, I still have uh, to measure lengths of the, uh, of the order of or displacement of the, the order of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's really amazing. Um, okay, this is the story that I wanted to anticipate. Uh, so the idea is that I can get, um, so I have, if I do everything correct and I eliminate all technical noise or classical noise, I still have noise because uh, light is quantum mechanical and so I have these quantum fluctuations, but I can make them uh, more and more uh, in influence uh, by having uh, a larger and larger intensity, which I can do in a cavity. Um, and uh, but at some point I arrive to the point uh, where I have the vacation on, on the mirror and then the mirror starts to jitter and this decreases again my precision. Okay, and then um, the last thing I, I, I want to cite uh, regarding radiation forces without the cavity. Uh, so even before the uh, emergence of, uh, um, of modern optomechanics, uh, they have been exploited um, for, for trapping and cooling uh, small objects, uh, like maybe like in the um, micrometer regime or even uh, single atoms. Uh, in this setting, I, I can really manipulate uh, um, like very tiny objects with the radiation pressure. But uh, an element of cavity of the mechanics is absent, so I usually do not have a big action of the motion on the light. Whereas in optomechanics, I can even have this regime. Okay, now I finally switch to the main topics, which is cavity of the mechanics. Um, yeah, so if you, I, I should side this review all the time, so I just do it now. So uh, if you want to know more um, about this, uh, um, about this, uh, the basics of this field and the state of the art, at least until 2014, um, there is this very good review from uh, Florian Marco, Marco Kaspermeyer and Tobias Kippenberg. It's a review of modern physics. Okay, so, um, so the first, um, okay, I start 
by describing the most prototypical automechanical system, um, and which is basically just a cavity which has a movable mirror. And the idea is that I'm injecting some light uh, in, into the cavity. To describe properly what's going on, I will do it later on. Um, I have also to describe uh, the interaction with the laser and with the electromagnetic field outside of the cavity, the interaction of the mechanics um, with, the, with its environment. But now I aim at very simple description that focus only on what happens inside of the cavity. So all the things I was talking about before are this plus and then the dots. I, now I just want to focus in a very simple Hamiltonian description to what happens inside the cavity. Okay, so the idea is that um, since the mirror can move, uh, the resonant frequency of, of the cavity um, will depend on the position of, of, of the mirror. So how? Uh, well, the idea is that um, the, um, basically the resonant frequency is the frequency at, we, at which I have a standing wave of, of the light. And so the idea is that, that this frequency time, the time that the photon travels, which is basically, uh, oh yeah, I forgot uh, factor two, which is basically the um, twice the length of the cavity divided by the speed of light. Um, so this phase should be uh, a multiple of two pi, such that I have constructing interference. Um, which means very simply that uh, 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 the cavity resonance, uh, in principle, I have many of them, and now I will focus on only one of them. Uh, I have many of them, uh, one, one for every possible integer value of n. Uh, but you see, so I will have this particular dependence of the cavity resonance on the displacement of the mirror. And now the idea is that the interaction I'm typically the auto, auto mechanical interaction is very small. And so um, the, the mirror will be displaced all the tiny bit. And so uh, what I can always do is like to do a Taylor expansion in, in, in the distance. And uh, um, so I consider more small vibrations. So this displacement is much smaller than the length of the cavity. And um, I uh, basically get that uh, I can replace this position dependence just as the amplitude uh, resonant frequency times the displacement and the deri derivative of the cavity with respect to the displacement. So in this simple case, I can very easily calculate the derivative and it's just the amplitude cavity resonance divided by the length. So this is um, all very simple. Um, okay, yeah, there is somebody <laughs> something missing. Okay, forget for the moment about this different picture. Uh, the, the point that I want, wanted to say, to, to make first is that, um, so then I can just write the Hamiltonian in this form. So I, um, there is this particular interaction which is linear in the position and describe basically a, um, a shift of the cavity, cavity frequency uh, by minus h bar. Uh, okay. Sorry, there is something missing in my story. Let me see if there is a slide that. Ah, okay, because. It... Okay, now, sorry, that was okay. It's coming up later. Okay, sorry for the interruption. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Um... Okay, so I wanted to. Um, okay, 
okay, right, then I can write the, the, the interaction in this way. And now here I wanted to make the point that um, that was only just a, an example. Uh, so there are indeed optomechanical systems that really look uh, like this, but not all optomechanical systems look like this. A very simple extension is just to have some the electric object inside the cavity. So this would also uh, change the, the, the resonant frequency of the cavity. And um, uh, so I could apply the same kind of Taylor expansion, only the, the tail formula of, of the optomechanical coupling will be different. Uh, and more in general, this form of the Hamiltonian is something very, very fundamental. And it's just a consequence of the, of the, of the fact that I'm studying the interaction between a very high frequency um, oscillator uh, with a much lower frequency oscillator. Uh, and then the idea is that this is really like the leading uh, order coupling. So I cannot have some kind of linear coupling because this, this will be really completely off resonance and will be absolutely negligible. So it will not have any effect. And so this is just the, the standard leading order coupling that I can have between a high uh, frequency uh, more than a small frequency mode. Um, okay, of course, if I can do, maybe I can do some extra work and I can make sure that this coupling is zero and then I can have, for instance, this happen if I put a, a, a membrane in the middle of a fabric per cavity and then maybe I will have a different dependence on the optomechanical coupling, but this is really the most general and natural kind of coupling between the high energy. Um, and a, a high frequency and a low frequency mode. Um, and so that's why it's not surprised, it should not be surprising that optomechanical system looks very different one from the other. There, there is really a huge soul of optomechanical system. Of course, uh, this does not mean that anything would work, right? So the, the, I, I, the art of creating a, a successful platform it's like i have to not thought this this coupling will be the most relevant in most of the cases that's very natural but it should be uh, also as large as possible in order to be able to explore the interesting effect that I, that i will show so i really have to uh so to 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 develop a, a platform where uh this coupling between the, the optical mode and the mechanical mode is, is large. And also at the same time, uh, I have very high quality modes. So very small optical decay rate, and very small mechanical direct decay rate. So it means that the system is otherwise very, uh, both the optical mode and the mechanical mode are otherwise very um, isolated from, from the environment. So here is a series of uh, very, uh, successful optomechanical platform. Uh, maybe I can uh, mention a few of them. Um, uh, so this looks pretty much as the <laughs> prototypical one. We, it's from Aspermine in Vienna. It was one of the early uh, devices and it really has a mirror on, on top of a cantilever. Um, uh, then there are uh, like like uh, more toroidal structure um, where the um, um, basically the the interesting uh, uh, optical mode is typically a, a whispering whispering gallery mode so a mode that goes around the rim of, of the toroid uh, whereas the mechanical mode is is a breathing mode in such a way that when when the breathing mode change the the length of the of, of, of the circumference of the system changes and then uh, this change very efficiently the mode. Uh, then another very interesting platform are this one by Oscar Painter um, and many other groups use this kind of platform. They are based on uh, optomechanical crystals. crystals. So here the idea is that uh, you have a periodic structure and uh, there will be a band gap uh, in this periodic structure and then you start to modify uh, you create a defect in the in, in the periodic structure and this uh, basically create a mode that is going to be in the band gap and so very 
um, very well isolated from the rest of, of the modes. Uh, and you do this, uh, yeah, the difficult thing is to be able to do this at the same time for the optical and, and mechanical part. Um, and uh, or an, an, another very, very interesting platform, this microwave platform, uh, yeah, the idea is that, um, uh, so I have this strand, this is the mechanical resonator, and uh, it changed the, the capacitance of the microwave uh, circuits. And so I can think of this as microwave light coupled to, to a mechanical resonator. Uh, and maybe, um, okay, it's a bit of a comment on this. So this is also like a very important and like early uh, platform here. The idea is to, to, there are many different groups that works based on this concept. Here the idea is that you have a very good fabric pero cavity and you make uh, you put a membrane uh, which uh, support a mirror in, into it uh, and then you you can have a very good uh, high quality uh, mirror that it's also a very high quality mechanical uh, uh, re resonator uh, so the, the 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 moving mirror does not need to be the end mirror of the cavity this is also the advantage that if you place the mirror in the middle you can have a different kind of coupling, this, this quadratic coupling. Um, and then there are also like a very interesting uh, system. Also this one, in this case, you basically you put an atom cloud uh, inside of, of, of the fabric pero cavity, and then you study the coupling of the motion, the collective motion of the atoms with the light. Okay. So yeah, some more picture where you see uh, the kind of vibration. This <laughs> is by the way has been written, has been this very nice drawing has been produced by Florian, uh, Florian Marco. Right? Yeah. Okay, and then also yeah, some kind of overview. So this is also a slide that I borrowed from uh, from Florian. Uh, so the idea is that uh, it's some kind of uh, historical overview um, uh, basically um, auto mechanics started more or less in 2006 in 2006 it really started to, uh, to explode there were area pioneering exp experiments um, and at the beginning the goal the goal was to achieve laser cooling of mechanical resonator and precision sensing and then um, uh, people started to develop a quantum toolbox, uh, uh, being able to transfer states from the optics to the mechanics, create optomechanical entanglement and such thing. And this is now like has led to uh, many applications like wavelength converse, uh, conversion, sensing filter. Um, and uh, then so a, 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 Connected to this, so a very fruitful and active field of research are hybrid systems. So finding way to couple optomechanical system with other systems like qubits, uh, atoms, quantum dot ions, uh, and then uh, there are more and more uh, unconventional system, uh, including uh, superfluids, uh, and where the rotational motion is investigated. And uh, and then people, one direction is to consider a system with more and more optical mode and consider uh, also a uh, question related to, to, investigate, to investigate topological physics. Uh, and then uh, a, a big direction of, of optomechanics uh, is, are the foundation. Uh, so to, yeah, the idea is that uh, to consider, try, try to create a uh, quantum superposition of uh, larger and larger mechanical ob object and to test uh, the coherence models like this proposal that, that uh, want to extend uh, quantum mechanics and uh, to maybe uh, in the hope that, um, uh, so yeah, the idea is that uh, to add some the coherence terms that, that would prevent uh, uh, the existence of uh, that was said that basically a fundamental uh, limit to to the possibility of creating a quantum state uh, in, the, in the macroscopic world. 
Okay, um, so yeah, <laughs> it's the thing that maybe I should have said already earlier. In fact, I thought it was already earlier. Uh, so now we can look back at um, our automechanical Hamiltonian. And uh, so we have seen we have this kind of interaction. And um, uh, so which is linear in the mechanical motion, uh, but um, it's uh, dispersive in, in the in the optical so basically it's it's a phase shift for for the cavity and there are two sides to this interaction uh, so basically it tells us that uh, so basically the, this this term in the Hamiltonian will give you give a, give us a force and this force is the radiation pressure so we have radiation pressure on the mechanical oscillator and on the other side, we have a mechanical induced shift of the optical resonance. So if I move, if I displace the mechanical oscillator, the cavity resonance will shift, and this in turn can change the um, uh, can can have a reflection on, on the cavity. So it can change the the light uh, circulating inside the cavity. And I will start, uh, and this is the end of my lecture for today, by the way. How am I doing with the time? Uh, oh, <laughs> it was even too short, I guess. But OK, I think I, can, I will spend 15 minutes on this. Um, um, OK, so I will start to give some very simple example of classical dynamics, classical optomechanical um, dynamics. Um, and um, um, okay, this is historically also like um, one of the first things that has been observed um, uh, in a very pioneering experiment that I will cite later. So yeah, the idea is that, as I mentioned, um, if I have some now I'm I'm shining light to my optomechanical system. And so this creates a number of circulating photons in, in the cavity. And so since, since I uh, and bar, and uh, since I have this circulating photon, this uh, will displace the equilibrium position of my, of my, my mechanical resonator. Uh, and in turn, uh, this uh, will then shift the cavity resonance. Uh, and uh, um, uh, if the shift of the cavity resonance, which now it's going to be given by g squared divided by n bar divided by omega, is larger than the resonance bandwidth, uh, which is set by the optical decay rate. So you have to imagine, so the, uh, I have this, I will have just a large displacement if I'm at the resonance within a bandwidth of k from the resonance frequency. But if my resonance frequency has, has changed by more than this kappa, it means that um, if I have a lot of light in, in my system, if I have a large number of circulating photons, I can have a, a, a large um, response, a, a large steady state response. Whereas if I start with uh, uh, um, very little light in the system, uh, I will have an off resonant response. And so there are two different stationary solutions one with a lot of light and the one with uh, with very little light. And so this is, um, this is what I was describing. You see, for a very, for a small power, I will have some Laurentian peak. And then this, uh, the peak will start to bend uh, because of the cavity shift. And at some point, I can have a situation where I have two solutions, a large frequency solution and a small frequency solution. This is the response of any actually weakly um, uh, nonlinear oscillator. Um, and it's just a simple consequence of the fact, because for any weakly nonlinear oscillator, the first effect on, on the nonlinearity, as I explained also before, uh, is uh, that the frequency um, uh, start to depend on the amplitude, and, I, and then I have this typical response, uh, which is known as for the Duffing oscillator also. And then in the particular case where uh, I'm in the regime where the, uh, the, the optical decay rate is much larger than the mechanical frequency, I can even uh, think that 
at every instant of time. Um, I'm in the stationary. I have the stationary um, amplitude in the cavity. And in this case, I can define even an effective potential for the mechanics. And I can see that this potential is best stable. OK, I wanted to cite this without going too much into the details of the calculation, uh, because this was really one of the early pioneering uh, experiment uh, uh, done by the Walter group already in 1983. Um, and uh, Again, so this work for any, I mean, I need to have really a lot of light in, 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 the, in the cavity. So the condition is that uh, G square and a strong optomechanical coupling. So the, the condition is G square divided by uh, times the number of sequel dating photon divided by omega and kappa is much larger than one, is larger than one. Um, uh, however, uh, it works also if, uh, if the mechanic, if I'm in the bad cavity regime, that the cavity decay very quickly. Uh, what is also interesting, if I start to have really very good cavity, uh, and I have a, really I have to con I start to have to really to consider that I have a finite uh, ring down coupling, uh, and in this case I start to have very interesting retardation effects. So how does it work in the simplest setting? So the idea is that, um, uh, so imagine that, um, so this is basically the, the blue is the response of the cavity if you wouldn't have any optomechanical coupling. Uh, imagine that you are changing X and now you set X, you, you apply force and you change X. Um, and then the idea is that uh, the cavity has the final Decay and so the, the response of the light will be just Lorentzian with, 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 with K. Uh, but now imagine that uh, you start, you start uh, this is the, the quadrostatic response if I change X very slowly. Now imagine that I, I, I start to, uh, to change X uh, more quickly. Um, and then what will happen is that I don't have time to decay in, in the steady state. And then I will, if I start with a small amplitude uh, and the amplitude is increasing, I will always have less, since I do not adapt quick enough, I will have less uh, circulate number of circulating photon inside of the cavity than the stationary state. Uh, whereas when I, when I, this on the red side, uh, when the, the, cap, the I have a laser and the, the cavity, the frequency of the laser is fixed, and uh, uh, by changing X, I change the resonance frequency. And um, uh, for um, um, so for small X, I'm in, in, in the red side. And then if I increase X, I go to the blue side. And then in that case, I start to have uh, uh, before the ring down time a larger a, a larger amplitude. And uh, and now you can consider the situation where imagine that I'm uh, my equilibrium position. Oops, my equilibrium position is somewhere here of the mechanical oscillator, and I'm having some oscillation. So I'm moving about this position like this. So what will happen is that when I'm moving um, in the direction. Uh, uh, of the force like this, I have a uh, smaller displacement, and uh, because yeah, the force is the is the same as the number of is proportional to the number of circulating photon. So when I I'm moving in the direction of the force, so x is positive and the force is positive, uh, I have a smaller uh, amplitude uh, than when I'm coming back, and so which means that. Um, Overall, I'm uh, um, so basically the I'm doing negative works at time the x is negative, which means that I'm absorbing energy from the mechanical oscillator, which means I'm cooling the mechanical oscillator. Whereas if you look, if you observe what happens on the on the other side of the resonance, uh, the opposite of Q, of Q. So in this case, I will have that. Uh, uh, when I'm moving, when the oscillation is for positive, when, when X increases, I have uh, a larger response, so a larger force. 
then uh, one x is decreasing. And so in this case, I'm doing work on, on the mechanics. And uh, so in a sense, I'm eating it, or this is also the regime where I can have amplification of, of mechanical motion. Okay. Uh, yeah, so actually I'm <laughs> a little bit early with the time, but this is what I had prepared for today. Um, so are there any questions? So there was no interaction. Hello, Clara, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, oh, maybe. Okay, <laughs> Um, maybe um, maybe I can ask one. Um, yeah. When you showed the two solutions, when you have the nonlinearity, yeah. um, so you have two possible uh, steady states, and um, I was wondering how would you, in practice, go from one to the other, or how would you manage to go into one steady state or in? Yeah, yeah, this is a good question. Sorry, I didn't uh, explain this. Uh, yeah, so the idea is that. Um, so if you start, imagine that you're in the, in the region where I have this rest, I potentially could have this stress and response. If I start with, um, with a very small amplitude in, in, the, in the cavity, uh, I, I'm out of resonance, so I will have this very small response. So I will be moving on this line here um, until uh, at some point the solution is not stable anymore and I switch to the other branch. And once I switch to the other branch, now I have a large amplitude. And if I uh, uh, change my laser the tuning again toward the um, again to, toward the side of the resonance, I will I will move in the in the large uh, in the large amplitude solution. So I can't really see any stereosis if I if I switch the frequency laser. Okay, thank you. So essentially, I just sweeps it a tuning and then I yeah uh, I, one solution but then I switch to the other yeah exactly okay. yeah so the physics is really very simple so there is uh yeah there is this you can very easily calculate what is the it's like this for any any weak nonlinear oscillator uh the weak not the first thing that the weak nonlinearity gives is uh is a resonant frequency that depends on the amplitude and if this shift is larger than the decay rate, you start to have this optical instability. Even mathemat mathematically, so this is this curve is uh, described by the solution of a third order polynomial equation, and you get exactly the same equation for the optomechanical system and, and a duffing oscillator. So a weekly, a single weekly nonlinear oscillator. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question in the chat from uh, Sofia. Mm -hmm. um, and she's asking uh, when we know um, if there is some criterion to know when the classical solution is valued or when we need the quantum version of these equations. Um, and then she asks, is it just dependent on the photo number or are there other factors involved like decoherence of the mechanical? Yeah, so I, we will, uh, um, we, I, I will explain this in detail in, in future lectures. But the idea is that this depends on the um, both on the decay rate of the mechanical cavity and uh, the decay of the optical uh, cavity, and there is uh, uh, a quant and on also on on the on the number of, of uh, uh, circulating photons, uh, and uh, yeah, and no, sorry, and also very important on the number of of uh, of thermal photons. So the idea is that, um, um, I mean, there is a very simple formula uh, of the quantum cooperativity. So uh, you have that uh, basically this, um, um, okay, but okay, let's say, maybe the simple way to say it, I really need that I have a, back, a typical uh, back action of, of the, of, of the, of, of the, of the cavity on, 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 on the mechanics, uh, a typical uh, scale rate, uh, which is like uh, the proportional to the, the interaction square divided by the optical decay rate. 
uh, and this should be faster than the time that the photon takes uh, that the phonon takes uh, uh, to enter the cavity and this is proportional to the mechanical decay rate and the number of thermal phonon in the cavity if this is the, if i'm in this regime i i can start to talk about quantum mechanical effects uh, so for instance in the same regime i, I can if i'm in these regimes uh, i can um, have cooling to the ground state uh, i can squeeze uh, the optical light i can create uh, um, entanglement between the the um, optical mode and, and the mechanical modes all the quantum stuff occurring in the same regime and the idea is that yes the i i should have a large enough number of circulating photons uh, and this should be compared with the product uh, of the um, and I have to multiply this by the number of thermal photon, and this should be compared with the product of the uh, of the, me the mechanical and optical decay rate. Okay, um, but we will uh, we, I will explain these things. So um, so don't worry if you're interested. I I will explain this in detail. Uh, so Sophia replies that uh, thank you, and she's looking forward to learn more. So I suppose. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I suppose the answer is that, uh, or, or her replies that, yes, we would like to hear more about this. There's another question which I think pertains to this, uh, to the nonlinearity that mm -hmm. we discussed before. Um, is the dynamics around the bistability a Hopf bifurcation? Uh, no, this not. Um, but you can have in optical mechanics uh, uh, of bifurcation. Um, this occurs. Basically, the idea is that we will also study this. Uh, I will introduce this. Uh, so yeah, the idea is that when I'm in this uh, regime where I have eating or amplification, so one effect of this is that it decre is decreasing uh, the effective uh, decay rate of the mechanical modes. And at some point, if I have a strong enough laser and I'm in this blue detune site, I can have this off bifurcation. So the, the, the decay rate of the of the mechanical motor, uh, motion uh, goes to zero, and uh, uh, basically I, I, I start to have this self-sustained uh, oscillation that increases exponentially until uh, the nonlinear term kicked in uh, to, to, to limit uh, these, uh, these oscillations. So it's, the answer is not the same thing, and we will <laughs> Uh, study this of bifurcation, which is an important uh, aspect of optomechanics. So I suppose you will comment on this a bit later. But uh, um, what what is then? Maybe this is going to um, maybe I so maybe it's going too far from too far for now. But um, what is the what is the criterion for a Hopf bifurcation? So what what do you call a Hopf bifurcation then in that case? Yeah, so in this off bifurcation, you go from a, from a solution which is static and, and a, a solution where you start to have this self-sustained oscillation which do not have a fixed phase. So it's some kind of um, uh, motion with, with a fixed amplitude, but where the phase is, is not, uh, is not uh, fixed. Uh, so it's whereas uh, in this instability they are all uh, like a static solution where the where the phase of the oscillation is basically set by the driving. Okay. And uh, most important is so I don't have I have only oscillation of the electromagnetic field, but the uh, the mechanical uh, oscillator is fixed uh, in a in a, in some equilibrium position, maybe having some very small pump like fluctuations, but it's not oscillating. Whereas when I start to add the self sustain oscillation, I really have that the, the mechanical mode starts to oscillate. So it's some similar as a mechanical uh, laser, so sense. Yeah. OK, thanks. So I think um, I also read from the chat that this is also a topic we'd like to hear more about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so this will come. <laughs> Uh, for the moment, I don't see any more questions in the chat, either on YouTube or in Zoom. If there are any last minute questions, I suppose now is the time. Otherwise, um, yeah, let us thank Vittorio for this fantastic.
first um, question and the great overview. And we're looking forward to the next uh, to the next uh, lectures. Uh, we'll have a lecture every morning this week um, at the same time, 10 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time or 11 a.m. Um, Central European Time or slightly different in a, depending on the time zone, wherever you are. Let me just uh, emphasize that if you haven't done it already, if you want to get the Zoom link for the other meetings, um, please sign up via Eventbrite and um, Marcus just put the sign up link in the chat because this way you will always get the new link every day just before the lectures, about 15 minutes before the lecture starts. Um, and then you, you, yeah, you will have the link for sure. If you have only signed up for one of the lectures, then you will not automatically get the link for the other lectures. So it's important that you really sign up for all of them. It's a bit cumbersome with Eventbrite, but yeah, that's important to get the links. So, and with this, let's uh, thank Vittorio again, and we're looking forward to see you all to, again tomorrow. Same okay, time. thanks very much. Um, I'm looking forward to it, <laughs> and have a nice afternoon. Bye-bye.